I finally finished making my large GPS tracker and today I want to share everything about it from hardware, firmware, mechanical, to some tests that I conducted, to some inevitable mistakes and glitches that I made and most importantly what I can do better next time. So the initial idea was to create the simplest possible communication node between just two devices. You can imagine bringing them out with you hiking or kayaking in a place where there might not be any mobile coverage. I have these devices in my hand now. PCBWay manufactured these devices and I'm so grateful for their prompt communication and education materials on their blog because PCB manufacturing is all about clarity. Let's start off with the outdoor range test. So my husband and I decided to start from a bridge under the open skies overlooking a tiny island. Within minutes of turning on the devices, both of them received their GPS fixes. Using LoRa communication, they then started exchanging their GPS locations, which were used to calculate the distance between each other. Looks like sometimes it was zero meters, sometimes two meters. Fairly accurate, I guess. Then my husband took the cycle off with one of the nodes while I stayed on the bridge. At this point, I wish I had mounted the device higher up instead of on the floor because I kept getting some GPS communication drop-offs. Maybe next time I'll bring along my tripod to mount the device. Also, when the other device was going through some trees or bends in the path, for quite a while there was no received signal. So I did not recalculate the distance between them and just increased the relative time. Once in a while, some corrupted data was also received. My code did not handle this and I was getting wrong distance calculations like 11,000 kilometers. I'm thinking of adding a cyclic redundancy check when receiving the data to remove this kind of error in the future. And finally, for the highest range tested, it was around 2 km mark. We were receiving clear signals with a straight line of sight. But I can improve a few more things. We could have gotten a longer range, but at this point, there was literally an island in the middle of the two devices. And it was getting a little logistically challenging to get a signal without any obstacles or bends. I also have not optimized anything yet in the software to give it a better range. I can't help but think of adding a 3D printed case next time when mounting on the bicycle, uploading a mechanical design with, for example, PCB Way, whether it is 3D printing or CNC machining, and getting them shipped to you is getting as easy as what we already do with our PCBs. Let's have a look at the bill of materials. There are 83 components in total with 52 of them to populate on the PCB. Well, that's because I have a lot of test points. The unique number of parts is about 31. If you look at the cost of all the materials, it's about 70 US dollars or 5,000 Indian rupees or slightly higher than 60 euros. This is a little expensive, but when I sort by cost, you'll see that the LoRa, e-ink and GPS modules are unsurprisingly among the highest. This entire nature of portability was possible because of the battery and power circuit. I'm using an 18650 battery with a 4200 milliamp hour capacity. I love this form factor because the battery holder footprint can be easily added to the PCB layout. 18650s can come in different packages and I chose the one with the button top. Just make sure the battery holder is also compatible mechanically to hold the ones with flat heads or button tops, whichever you choose. I used the polarized SMD battery holder. There are certain dangers like shorting or overcharging when building a battery charger, hence I chose the option of a battery with built-in protection. Other than the battery, a micro USB cable can also be used to power the device. And I always put a little switch to power on and off. It makes it easy for testing testing and debugging. The USB cable can also charge the battery when used together. The IC MCP7383 is used as a LiPo charge management controller with an LED to indicate when it is charging. Even though the PCB design can charge the battery, I found it very useful to have an external battery charger. It's something we have in our household and we are increasingly replacing all disposable AA batteries with the rechargeable LADA from IKEA. 
Bonus, it can do various other types of batteries, including 18650. For comparison, a completely discharged 18650 battery takes about three and a half hours with an accumulated capacity of 1000 milliamp hours. And when it is fully charged, the display on the charger will change to full. To measure the charging time with the onboard IC, I hooked up two wires to the test points of VBAT and ground and connected them to the data logger of my multimeter. After the charge LED was off, I took out the SD card and plotted the CSV data. It took about 11 hours to completely charge the battery using the onboard LiPo charging circuit. 11 hours, this is where I think I can do better next time. I took a look at the data sheet of the charge controller. The charge current is programmable ranging from 15 milliamps to 500 milliamps. This can be done by varying the charge current programming resistor connecting the pins PROG to VSS. To measure the battery life, I did something similar to charging. I got a gauge of the shortest to the longest possible battery life by running two tests. A blinky LED for the longest possible and the demo code where all the sensors and the actuators on the board are used. The setup with the data logger in the multimeter was the same, but I also ran the second node for the entire P2P communication in the shortest battery life test. After plotting the two charts, it seems that the longest possible battery life with the blinky code was about 19 hours and the shortest possible was 14 hours because that's when the e-ink stopped updating. But the multimeter kept measuring the VBAT and there was a nice graph even after the device stopped working. And the discharge graph was very similar to something we see of a typical LiPo battery. For wireless communication, LoRa was used, not LoRaWAN, because there was no gateway, just a simple P2P connection between two devices. Before buying the LoRa radio module, take note of the frequency allowed in your country. I also used a stub antenna of the same frequency using an SMA connector. Mechanically, this was very stable because I could screw the antenna onto the PCB. As for the firmware, I used the Arduino LoRa library with the example on LoRa duplex. As for the GPS, I used the tiny form factor of a module measuring just 1 cm. Module PA1010D from CDTOP even has a built-in ceramic patch antenna on the top. I first saw this module in a dev board by Adafruit and wanted to use it. The schematic for this module is pretty simple. Since UART interfaces use the pins TX and RX are connected to the microcontroller. When the GPS module is first connected via the UART interface, the raw NEMA strings can be seen streaming in via the serial console. I used Adafruit's GPS library, the hardware serial passing example code as a reference for the firmware to pass the data. After getting a GPS fix and parsing the NEMA strings, we should be able to see the required information such as latitude, longitude, speed, altitude, satellites, and even the current time and date. The schematic also includes a red LED connected to the PPS or pulse per second pin and it blinks every second after receiving the GPS fix. It's pretty cool to watch the two devices blink precisely at the same time. After all, they know the current time very accurately because GPS has an accuracy of about one microsecond. Next is something to consider about the format of the GPS latitude and longitude. Most popular formats include DMS in degrees, minutes or seconds and decimal degrees. It's probably cool to say that the southernmost point of the world is at 55 degrees, 58 minutes south, 67 degrees, 16 minutes west, but not very convenient for calculations in our code. That's why it's better to use the decimal degrees format of minus 50 55.98 minus 67.27. In the firmware, a struct is used to define the GPS coordinates so that a single floating point data type can be used for latitude and longitude. Every coordinate starts with a false GPS fix and upon receiving the GPS fix, this Boolean value becomes true. Using this struct, consider a calculation that I use very frequently for both the devices. It is the have a sign formula that calculates the distance between two GPS coordinates as they are sent over LoRa. 
To be honest, I let GitHub Copilot help me write this formula and it is pretty similar to Wikipedia, but there is also a slight time component. Consider the locations of two coordinates. It only makes sense to calculate the distance if the time difference is relatively small, for example, one second. It will not make sense if two coordinates are captured, for example, an hour after each other. Hence, before calculating the have assigned distance, I always check that the two coordinates are within 10 seconds of each other. And if they are far apart in time, I add a time delay. For example, this device received its GPS coordinates and peer coordinates approximately 54 seconds ago. For displaying the information, an e-ink screen was used because I wanted to play with it. I loved that even after the batteries were taken out or completely discharged, the display kept the last printed information. But because I used the module version, it was a little clunky. I used some standoffs and screws to fix it on the PCB. Maybe next time I can consider just the raw display panel instead of the entire module, but that will also require some circuitry. The firmware is the ePaper library by Waveshare, and I had to use both versions 1 and 2 for 1.54 inches because my e-ink module versions were different. I also could not rotate the entire display to print all the information required. Hence, you see the GPS coordinates and the dates are in portrait format, while the have assigned distance is in landscape format. I tried the rotated example as an image, well, something to look into further. The heart of the device connecting all the peripherals like LoRa, GPS, and the e-ink is the microcontroller SAMD21G. Using Arduino Zero as the base, a custom Arduino board called Oak was created. The Arduino ID can then compile and upload the code to this custom board, but I prefer to use the command line with make files. Hence, I use Arduino CLI to compile and upload the firmware on this board. But here's the catch. I have two different PCBs here with slightly different configurations and different features such as LoRa, GPS, e-ink, etc. And I ideally want to use the same code base to compile and upload to these two versions or potentially more. The SRC folder can be used to organize the features separately because the contents inside are compiled recursively. And inside each of these folders, there are the subsequent header and C++ files, which can then be copied over to other projects. Both the PCBs also have different local and destination addresses for LoRa communication. Instead of hard coding these exact addresses, we can set global macros via dash D compiler flags. For example, the local and destination addresses can now be easily swapped in a separate makefile target for each device. Finally, the e-ink displays on two different PCBs were of different versions. But once again, I wanted one single code base to be able to flash into two different PCBs with two different versions of e-ink. I do not know whether this is the correct way, but I used a hack with Simlinks. Let me know if there's a better way. Basically, the lib folder has e-ink versions 1 and 2. And just before compiling, Simlinks are created from the lib folder to the SRC folder. There is another global macro for e-ink underscore v2. If that is defined, then version 2 of the library is used. If not, version 1 is used. After the compilation, the simlinks are immediately removed. Well, now that I have a working prototype of a LoRa GPS tracker, I can't help but think how much this little guy has inspired me to build my own. It's the LilyGo TTGo T-Beam, and if you are looking to buy such a device, I will recommend it because I have used it myself. You can also refer to their open source firmware and schematic documents if you want to build one. I used to be so clueless about what should be my first steps as I navigate this complex world of IoT technologies. As Miles Davis once said, imitate, then innovate. And David Perel here probably expands on this to explain, find your creators, copy their styles, and you will eventually develop your own. With that, I would love to know what applications are you thinking of for a LoRa GPS tracker? I have detailed links to each of the chapters in this video, so go and have a look at them for reference. Let's have a discussion in the comments below, and uh, thanks for watching. See you next time.